Hello, my name is Kishwani. S K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. Today we'll have our vocabulary quiz number 15 on the on the words that we covered that we learned from day number 71 through 75 in our vocabulary series. Now on day number 71, the first few words that we discussed were actually pairs of words where we discussed the correct pronunciation of singular form and the plural form of a given word. What I would like you to do is to watch, what I would like you to do is to type in this thing, mispronounce plural along with my name if, if it doesn't pop up and watch that video. Simply mispronounce plurals. And you will watch, you will watch that video where, where we come across many instances where when people are not paying attention they end up mispronouncing the plural form of the word. For example, for example, Parenthesis is singular. Parenthesis. If it's plural, it's, per, it's spelled, the spelling changes to S-E-S and the pronunciation changes from parenthesis to parentheses. Similarly, if you have a word, hypothesis, hypothesis, the plural form is S-E-S. This, the, again, the I becomes the E, and the pronunciation changes from hypothesis to hypothesis. And there are several others. When you watch the video, you will, you will learn them. Let's move on then. The next word, the very first word we're going to talk about after, the, after these pairs of words, the very first word we learned on day number 71 was Suffice. Very simple, very straightforward pronunciation. So, suffice. What does it mean to suffice? Suffice is a, is a word and it comes from the word sufficient. It means to be, to be, to be sufficient, to be enough, to be enough, to be adequate, to be adequate. For example, for example, if, if you ask somebody, how many eggs would you like in your omelet? Would you like two or three eggs in your omelet? The person might say, well, two should suffice. Two eggs would be enough for me. Two should suffice. Two should be enough. Just give me one second. I'm going to, I need to change the marker because this marker, well, let's try the ones that I'm holding in my hand now. So let's, keep, keep, let's keep on going. If this one, oh, this one is good. The next word we learned was fame. It's pronounced fame. It's a verb. What does it mean to fame? Fame means to to pretend, to pretend, to give the false impression of something, to give the false appearance of something, false appearance of something, to pretend. For example, if I tell you, if I tell you, could you go? Could you go get Michael from the other room? And you said to me, Michael, I believe, is sleeping in the chair. He's sleeping. And I said, ah, he's not sleeping. He's just, he's just feigning. He's just pretending. He's just pretending to sleep. He's not sleeping. He's just feigning. So go, go get him. Okay? He's feigning. He is feigning. He is pretending. Let's keep on going. We are still on day number 71. Next word we learned was unwittingly. Unwittingly. What does it mean to do something unwittingly? It means to do something, to do something without realization. Without realization. To do something, to do something. Unintentionally, if you end, end up doing, if you didn't intend to do it, it, you didn't do it intentionally. If you ended up doing, if you ended up doing something unintentionally, you didn't mean to do it. You did it unintentionally. You'll say, "Well, I did it unwittingly. I did it unwittingly. I did it. I did it without realizing. I did it without realization. I did it unintentionally. I did it inadvertently. To do something. To do something." 
in adverb and inadvertently. Inadvertently is the word we learn on day number 40 in the same series, vocabulary is day number 40. It means to do something, to do something without without being cognizant, without being cognizant. And the noun of cognizant is cognizance. So if you do something without your cognizance, you're doing it without realizing it. You're doing it inadvertently, you're doing it unintentionally, you're doing it unwittingly. Do you understand? Next word we learned was You see the word known in there? Un be nonced. Unbeknownst. I don't know if you can read that low. I'm gonna write the pronunciation in the top. Un be unbeknownst. If you do unbeknownst me it's an adjective, it means to be uh, to be unaware of something. To be to be unaware of something. To be to be to to, to, to not know, to not have a knowledge. Without knowledge of something. Without without knowledge or something unbeknownst unbeknownst for example for example mom tells michael mom tells michael to go to his bedroom and do the homework so michael being a good boy goes to his bedroom what does he do after what does he do after he arrives at the bedroom well he opens the bedroom window jumps out and he's outside playing with his friends. He's outside in the in the lane uh, in, on the street playing with his friends. Whereas his mother is under the impression that Michael is in the bedroom doing the homework. But unbeknownst to her, unbeknownst to her, Michael is doing no such thing. Unbeknownst to her, Michael is doing no such thing. Michael is outside in the street playing with his friends. Unbeknownst. Let's keep on going. The next word we learned was. We are going through this first fast because the purpose of this quizzes, these quizzes, and which is why they are called quizzes, is not to learn the words for the very first time. Presumably you have watched the videos, you have learned the words. This is just a review, a quick review. The next word we learned was, and hence the handwriting. I write it in a sloppy handwriting because you're not, you're not looking at it for the very first time. More of uh, Bunt, moribund. Again, it's an adjective. What does it mean to be moribund? Moribund means to be almost dead. Almost dead. On the verge of dying. On the verge of dying. It's not dead yet. It's not dead yet, but it's almost dead. On the verge of dying. Verge. V-E-R-G-E. -E. On the verge of dying. More of them. and you you may have heard me. You may have heard uh, uh, the word uh, from me many a times when the marker is marker is not writing very well. I said that this marker is moribund. This marker is almost dead. Let, let me have a new marker. Give me a second so I can grab the new marker because the one I have in my hand is moribund. It's almost dead. It's not working anymore. Let's move on. We are on day number seventy-two now. On day number seventy-two. We talked about a couple of words that are homonyms. That are homonyms. What are homonyms? Homonyms are two words. Homonyms are two words that are pronounced in the same way, but they have different spelling and different meanings. They have different spellings, different meanings, but they are pronounced in the same way. Those are called homonyms. And if you're interested in learning 
some homonyms, just type in just type in oh for Christ's sake I don't know how to spell homonyms just type in homonyms along with my name anytime you're looking for a certain topic just type in the topic along with my name the video will pop right up homonyms there are 10 videos that we have done on the subject of homonyms where you will learn 100 pairs of homonyms 100 pairs of homonyms again one more time what are homonyms homonyms are two words that are that are spelled differently they have different meaning but they are pronounced in the same way the very first word we learned on day number 15 was canvas canvas with one s canvas can was canvas if it has one word if it, if it has if it has only one s canvas with one s it's a fabric fabric that is used for painting fabric used for painting or to make tents or, or to make the sail for the board you need canvas before you start painting you need a canvas you need a fabric on which you're going to paint and that fabric is called canvas that's one meaning that's one word rather not one meaning but the same pronunciation is used for a word with not one s but two s's this is no longer a noun this is a verb it has a different meaning same pronunciation but it has a different meaning it has two meanings as a matter of fact canvas means to to take pole to take pole to solicit door to door if you go around soliciting door to door either for political purposes you're running for an office and you knock on everybody's door in the village and you ask them will you vote for me election is coming up I'm running for the mayor would you would you vote for me and you do go around door to door in the village that's called canvassing or you can go door to door because you're selling something you're selling a subscription to a magazine or you're taking a poll whatever is, whatever it is that you're doing is called canvassing that's one meaning second meaning of the word canvas means to examine something to examine something closely to study something closely to scrutinize to Well, I'm not going to write it because I don't know how to spell it. To examine something closely. If you study something closely, if you scrutinize something very closely, it's called canvassing. Or you can take polls, or you can solicit for vote, for, 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 for a vote, or, for, or you might take opinion poll, and that's called canvassing as well. But that canvas, that canvas is spelled with two S's. So don't confuse the two. What does this expression mean? To gain, to gain currency. If someone says that that theory, if someone says that that theory is gaining currency, so that idea, that idea is gaining currency. That theory is gaining currency. What does it mean to gain currency? To gain currency means to become, to become widely acceptable to become widely acceptable it, it means to become popular if something becomes more popular that theory that notion that idea was not uh, very popular not too many people believed in it but lately more and people more and more people are believing in it then you said that it is gaining currency let's move on we're still on day 72 Breach. What does it mean to breach? Breach is a violation. A violation is a noun. It is a violation or infraction, if you like, or 
infraction if you want to use the legal jargon legal law language of the law infraction violation it's called breach people talk about breach of trust people talk about breach of confidence people talk about breach of contract a breach of contract means you violated the terms of the contract you broke the contract breach of contract breach of trust you you violated my trust breach of uh, breach of agreement Breach of confidence. Could be anything. Let's go to the next one. The word is inordinate. In or inordinate. What does it mean? It's an adjective. What does it mean if you, if you describe something as being inordinate? It means it is excessive. It is excessive. Unreasonable. Too much. Way more than what is considered, what may be considered suitable by most people. Anything that goes above and beyond what is considered reasonable is said to be inordinate. You can take inordinate amount of money, rather you can take inordinate amount of time to do something. You may spend inordinate amount of money on a given project. Uh, it can be used anywhere. One might have, one might purchase inordinate amount of clothing for, for an occasion. It could be used anywhere. It just, it could be used in any, in any context. It just means excessive, unreasonable amount. Do you understand? This word crops up many times when you're doing the math problems. And I would explain to you that if you do the problem in a classical way, traditional way, orthodox way, conventional way, academic way, it will end up taking you inordinate amount of time. It will end up taking you excessive amount of time, unreasonable amount of time, which is why we have to learn some quick and dirty way of solving problems, math problems. Doesn't matter which exam you're preparing for, whether you're preparing for GRE or GMAT or TEAS or HESES or SAT or ACT. If you're going to do the math problem in this, in this, in this, uh, in this, uh, for these tests, you have to learn to find shortcuts, quicker way. We don't, one does not sit there and solve it in a classical academic way. That takes an inordinate amount of time. Let's go on then. The next word we learned was inebriated. In e Three, a, eight, ten. Inebriated. In e bri a eight, it. You put it together. Inebriated. Inebriated simply means to be drunk. To be drunk. That's all it is. To be under the influence of alcohol. I'm not going to write all of that down. To be under the influence of alcohol, to be, to be intoxicated. Do you understand? That's all. Let's move on to day number 73. Day 73. Let's see what we learned on day 73. The very first word we learned on day 73 was, so now we are on 73, not 72. How do we pronounce this word? It's pronounced jejun. It's an adjective. What does it mean if you describe something as being jejun? Jejun means it's not, it's not robust. It's not robust. It's not, it's insubstantial. It is insubstantial. It is immature. Which is uninteresting. It could be also be uninteresting. Uninteresting because it's not substantial. It's not. It's not robust. It's, it, it, it's immature. It is. Uh, it is. Uh, 
Where can we put it? Infantile. It is pure. Pure. P. Pure. If you describe something as infantile, the word infantile comes from the word infant. Infant. Childish. See? If somebody makes an argument about something and if you feel that that argument is not very substantial, if you feel that that argument is not very solid, if you feel that that argument was not, not robust, you can say, well, that ar your argument is very childish. Your argument is very infantile. It's very puerile. It is jejun. Your argument is jejun. Let's move on then. The next word we learned was were be or victim. What does it mean to describe something as verbatim? It just means word for word. It just means word for word to quote someone to quote someone what's the antonym of verbatim if somebody says something if somebody says something and you say it exactly the way that person said it well in that case you're quoting the person you're saying it exactly how they said it you're quoting the person you're saying exactly what they said you're saying it verbatim you're saying it word for word well what if you Express what the other person said in your own words. What's the antonym of verbatim? Antonym of verbatim is antonym of verbatim is paraphrase. If you paraphrase something, that means you're saying it in your own words. You're not saying exactly the way it was said. You're saying the same thing, but in your own words. Let's move on. mean when you describe something as visceral? If it's described as visceral, that means you feel it at your gut level. You feel it at your gut level. It was visceral to have intuition. To have if you have an intuition about something, you feel it in your guts. You can't express why it is like this, you just feel it, you feel it in your guts, you have the intuition, you have the inkling, uh, you have, you have inkling, you have, you have a hunch about something, then you say that I felt it uh, in my guts, it was visceral. It was visceral. So if somebody says this is, for example, if, uh, let's use the word in the sentence. For example, you might say that my decision, my decision to become a teacher was more of a visceral decision, not cerebral one. Cerebral means uh, intellectual. It comes from the cerebral cortex in your brain. It was not cerebral. It was not intellectual. I did not think it out. I did not plan it that way. I became a teacher because that's what I felt like doing, that's what I felt in my guts. It was a, the decision was visceral, not cerebral. It was not intellectual. Do you understand? The word is cerebral. Let's keep on going. We are on day number 74. I'm skipping some, some words here and there. I'm skipping some words here and there because the last video that I made, which was quiz number 14, turned out to be 50 minutes long and I don't want to make a 50 minutes long video, so I'm going to skip few words here and there. If you're interested in learning all the words, you can watch the actual video.
We are on 74. The very first word we learned was not. What does it mean? Not. Not is simply a very fancy way of saying zero. Zero. Nothing. Nothing. My alarm did not go off on time. I I got up. I got up a little later than I, a half an hour later than I wanted to get up. I, I took a shower in a hurry. I packed my suitcase in a hurry. I, I uh, drove like a maniac to the airport, absolute maniac, uh, to the airport. And finally, when I arrived at the airport, I found out that my plane was cancelled because of uh, whatever the problem that they're having at the airport. My my plane was cancelled. My plane, plane, my plane was my plane did not take off. It was all for naught. All the hassle, all the trouble that I went through in the morning, it was all for naught. It was all for nothing. It was all for naught. All my trouble, all my hassle was for naught. Let's learn one more synonym of the word naught is this word. And it's pronounced Cipher, cipher. Now this is a tricky word, so I'm gonna we're gonna take our time and I'm gonna change the marker. Now if you pronounce it as cipher, it has one meaning, but this word, same exact word, if you pronounce it as if you pronounce it as cipher, it's a long I, cipher, cipher, not not cipher, not cipher, but cipher long i, it has a different meaning. Cipher is a verb. What does it mean to cipher? To cipher means to write something, to write something in a, in a, coded language, to write something in a, Coded language to encode, to encode, to encrypt. And in that sense, you would pronounce it as not as cipher, cipher is a zero. Cipher, this pronunciation of the word cipher right here, this pronunciation is an Arabic word. This is an Arabic word, cipher. It is used in English language. It is used in English language because it was the Arabs who first taught the Europeans the notion of a zero. They invented the notion, they invented the idea of a zero. And they called it cipher. So that's what it is, cipher. Even in the English language, if you say cipher, it means zero. But if you pronounce it as cipher, it has a different meaning. Now, if you use it like this, then we're going to write down the antinom on the top, or perhaps we can do it right here. The antinom. The antinom of cipher, antinom of cipher would be decipher. What does it mean to decipher? Decipher means to break, to break code. If somebody wrote something in a coded language and you were able to break the code and you were able to read it, well, you just deciphered it. You just deciphered it. Let's move on then. The next word we learn on day number 74. was cliche cli cliche what is a cliche a cliche is an old familiar saying an old familiar saying saying that you hear all the time a cliche is a is a proverb it's a maxim it's a saw it's an adage all of these words that you see there, we learned on day number 45. Day number 45. We learned these words. I'm not going to go over them right now. A maxim, a proverb, a saw, 
an adage, a cliche, an all familiar saying. It, something that is something because it is all and because because it is used so so often, it loses its punch. It becomes banal. It becomes uninteresting. It becomes cliche. It becomes. It becomes banal. It becomes it's something that is something that is hackneyed, something that is so horrific, something that is prosaic, something that is pedestrian. If you describe something as being pedestrian, Pedestrian has one uh, one meaning everybody knows, but if you describe something as being pedestrian, but it means it is dull, it's uninteresting, it's ordinary, it's like a cliche, it's hackneyed, it's boring, it's banal, it's trite, it's trite, it's cliche. All of these words that you see here, we have already learned these words, and you will find all of these on day number 13. Day number 13. Make sure that you are in the right series. We have two series of vocabulary. One is a series which is labeled as Hesse vocabulary words. That's a different series which only goes up to day 25. I'm talking about this main series of vocabulary words. It doesn't matter which exam you're preparing for, whether you're preparing for GRE or GMAT or TES or Hesse or SAT or SAT. Just type in the name of your test. Just type in GRE vocabulary words. GRE vocabulary words, day 13. The video will pop right up. Watch that video and learn these words. These are good words to know. No for GRE, for GMAT, for SAT, for SAT. It doesn't matter which exam you're preparing for. The very last word we learned on day number 73, I believe, we are on, was onus. Onus, that means a burden. A burden, a responsibility. A burden or a responsibility. If someone says, the onus is on you, that they're telling you that you're, you're responsible for it, you should do it, it's your job, it's, you're, you're required to do it. Onus is on you, the burden is on you, you're responsible. And the adjective, this is the noun, the adjective would be onerous. If you describe something as being onerous, what you're trying to tell me is that it, you find it burdensome, you find it burdensome, you find it difficult, you find the task uh, heavy, you find it's a heavy responsibility. It's onerous duty. It is an onerous duty. Oh, we are on, on 74. What do you know? We are moving right along. So that was the end of day number 74. Very last day, day number 75. Day 75. Very first word we learned, very first word we learned was Enumerate. E. New. That's the second syllable. M. Rate. Enumerate. What does it mean to enumerate? Enumerate is just a very fancy way of saying to make a list of something. To make a list of something. If someone tells you, if your teacher tells you to enumerate all your reasons behind this argument, he or she is asking you to make a list of them, list them one by one, to count them, to name them one by one, enumerate them. Let's move on. The next word we learned was adulterate. A dull to read. What does it mean? It's, it's a verb. What does it mean to adulterate? Adulterate means to make something, to make something impure, to make something impure. It is no longer pure, it is adult, it has been adulterated. It has been adulterated, it is no longer pure, which is where the word adultery comes from. Adultery does not mean what most people think. That's the the, the literal meaning of the word adultery means that you have made your marriage impure. By committing adultery, that act that you committed, you have made your marriage impure. It is. It has been, the marriage, the vow you took has been adulterated, 
hence the adultery. You understand? If someone says that uh, he's speaking unadulterated drivel, well, what does it mean to speak unadulterated drivel? Unadulterated, unadulterated. If adulterated means impure, then unadulterated means unadulterated means pure. If someone tells you, if you're buying something, a jewelry or something, and the salesperson in the jewelry store assures you, uh, Mr. Johnson, I assure you, this necklace is 100% gold. It has not been adulterated. It is thoroughly unadulterated. It is thoroughly impure. Uh, rather, it is thoroughly pure. It is unadulterated. Unadulterated drivel. What is drivel? Drivel is, it has two meanings. Drivel literally means, drivel literally means to drool. Have saliva dripping down the side of your mouth. You're driveling. It also means to speak nonsense, to speak nonsense. To speak nonsense. So if, you're, if someone accuses you of speaking unadulterated drivel, what they just told you is that you're speaking pure nonsense. Let's learn some words which all mean drivel. They all mean nonsense. All of these words that we're going to learn, they all mean nonsense. First was drivel. Gibberish. Poppycock. Humbug. Piffle, cockamamie, gobbledygook, and two blather. Some of them are verbs, some of them are nouns, but they all basically mean the same thing. They all mean to speak nonsense, to speak foolishly, to speak in a way that is senseless, to speak nonsense, to speak in a foolish way, to be silly. Let's go through them, shall we? To drivel means to, to speak nonsense. Gibberish is nonsense. If, you, if, you, if somebody accuses you of, if they're saying, well, that's just gibberish. What they're telling you is that what you're telling me it's just nonsense it doesn't mean anything it's just gibberish you use too many big words and you use so many terminologies in your sentences but you're not really telling me anything it's all gibberish it's nonsense it's poppycock humbug piffle piffle cockamamie cockamamie and finally gobbledygook gobbledygook is, is an interesting word some people spell it with an e some people spell it, spell it with an e and some people spell it some people spell it with a Y. Gobbledygook. And finally, blather. I'm going to leave it up to you to actually watch the video day number 75 and learn these words properly in great details. Okay? Bye-bye.